guys, what's up? This is the Drum Zone podcast. We're uh, doing a movie review this week. Uh, this week we're going to be reviewing Spring Breakers. Uh, right now it's just me and Eagle we're doing this uh, review. What up, Eagle? What up? How's it going? Not much. Uh, so yeah, so it's just going to be me and him doing this review this week, so it's probably not going to be too long. And this week we are reviewing Spring Breakers. A good movie. A great movie. So, uh... How do we start off talking about Spring Breakers? It's kind of a weird movie to talk about, honestly. I think before, if you liked, if you saw the trailer for Drive and wanted to see Drive and then saw Drive and didn't like it, I would say the exact same thing about Spring Breakers. Yeah. Because there were a lot of teenagers who wanted to see this movie by watching the trailer because you have all the Disney girls in it and James Mm -hmm. Franco's kind of big. And so all these girls wanted to see this movie and then they ended up hating this movie. Yeah, it's definitely not... A movie that anyone can really go to and enjoy. It's it's not your typical like party movie, that's for sure. No, no. It's directed, for those of you who may or may not know, it's directed by Harmony Kareen. It was also written by him. Uh, this is his most mainstream film. Uh, you might have seen his other movies, Kids. Uh, that was his, his first movie. He ended up writing that. He did not direct it. He wrote that. Uh, he also made Gummo, which is also a very good movie. Uh, and he made Trash Humpers, which came out a few years ago, not as popular. And he's made a ton of short films. Uh, I haven't seen Mr. Lonely. Uh, that's another one of his features. But he has a ton of shorts. One of my favorite shorts is uh, his short with D. Antwoord. Uh, it's just all his movies don't ever have plots, and neither do his shorts. They're mo- they're more like moments in time. And, like, just scenes between people. They're almost like documentaries, but, like, acted out documentaries, of course. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so if you're not a fan of his or if you've never seen any of his work, then you probably won't like this movie right <laughs> off the bat. The the one thing I say for people who kind of know about movies and, like, what goes on behind the scenes, the editing in this movie is insane. Like... Oh, yeah. No, I don't think anyone else could edit a movie like this. I mean, they will be able to now because they've seen the style, but no one... Like, it's kind of weird. It's almost like uber quentin tarantino yeah it's like how do you pitch that to your editor when you're going in basically the editing what we're talking about okay for we'll get into spoilers actually in a second right now we'll just give our quick overview of the movie right uh basically i'm just gonna say i really liked it this is my second favorite movie of the year uh right behind place beyond the pines uh i really like spring breakers um i thought it was really well done james franco's awesome i thought the first hour of the movie was terrific Uh, But then we'll get on to that later on. But yeah, overall, I'd say it's a great movie. Definitely not for everyone, like I said. But at the same time, if you haven't seen it, I would keep an open mind to watching it. Because a lot of people will just look at it like they did with Drive and say, oh, what a piece of crap. And I've had arguments with people about this movie and Drive and how it's brilliant. And people just look at me like I'm retarded. But believe me, if you're a a film person, you're going to like this movie most likely. If you're not a film person... There's a good 50-50 chance you're probably not going to like it. It's almost like the ultimate movie for film students kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's like It's got that really out there vibe. I would say it's also my second favorite movie behind Place Beyond the Pines, but that's really only because there hasn't been too many movies out there this year that have been that great. I mean... No, if you look back at what we've watched in the past four months, yeah. uh, there's been like <laughs> Evil Dead, which we're hopefully going to do a review of that soon, but spoiler alert, I wasn't a big fan of it. Uh, Die Hard 5, which was oh, terrible. Man. It's not even worth doing a review about. <laughs> no, we're not doing a review of Die Hard 5. Yeah. Uh, side effects, I didn't, you seemed to like it more than I, I did. It, yeah. I enjoyed it, I thought it was a well-made movie, but it wasn't, it didn't really stick out to me as anything special. I think it's really well-written, for sure. It is well-written, I'll give you that. Yeah. Um. And, uh, I mean, Pain and Gain. Pain and Gain, I would say, is my third favorite, but that's almost third by default, because... Yeah, that's like me with this movie, second by default. Yeah. Like... Because there hasn't really been anything special yet. We got the summer movies coming up, but let's face it, there's really no chance of a lot of these summer movies making our top tens by the time the year's done when all the Oscar yeah. movies come out. I mean, maybe Iron Man 3 if it's that good that people are I'm hyping ho- it up to be. I'm hoping Iron Man 3 is good. The only summer movie I could see actually making my top ten is Elysium. Oh, no Blomkamp's yeah. next movie. And I still have to see Trance as well. It's true, we still got to see Trance. That's I think that might be playing in the local indie theater. Nice. But yeah, overall, I did enjoy the movie, and I would say if you're a film person, definitely watch it. You'll probably most likely uh, like the movie. Uh, but like I said, if you're not into movies and you're going into this movie thinking it's some type of 
a spring comedy movie because that's what I feel like a lot of these mm-hmm. girls are going in to watch it, like these younger generations who don't know what this stuff is about. Yeah. Like they're going into it thinking, oh, I'm about to go watch a funny <laughs> kind of crime comedy type yeah. of movie about girls who kind of get out of control. This is more of like a, a hyper-realistic take of what would actually happen. And I think the first half of the movie caters to those people. Like the first half of the movie is oh, almost yeah. like you could watch that part and be like, Oh yeah, this is exactly what I thought it would be, and then it, boom, it switches in a heartbeat. It's it's completely different. But um, like we said, oh yeah, you finish up and then we'll go in the spoilers. Yeah, yeah. So like, I don't. know, What would you give it out of ten? I would probably give it a seven point five out of ten. I would give it a solid eight. Yeah, solid eight, maybe eight point five. I'd have to watch it again. We did see it twice in the theater, and right. I enjoyed it both a lot of times. Usually. The second viewing is the crucial viewing, because mm-hmm. you can watch a movie once, and you could be like, oh, that was brilliant, that was genius. Yeah. And then you watch it again, and you're just like, what the fuck was I thinking? The one thing I'll say, like, the second time I watched it, it was a little bit slower, but that's just because the first time you watch it, you're like, what the hell is going to happen? Like, you have no idea what's going on. I think this this one definitely deserves, deserves a second view, even if you didn't like it the first time. Mm-hmm. Watch it a second time, just because you'll know what's going to happen, and then you can kind of appreciate the filmmaking more. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to get into spoilers. So right off the bat, I want to say that the second half of this movie slows right down. Uh, not, it, I think the pacing of this movie is amazing all the way up until the strip club scene. As soon as that strip club scene finishes, and it's all about kind of James Franco falling in love with Vanessa Hudgens' character and the Ashley Benson character, yeah. that's where I find the movie slows down a lot. And then, of course, the ending picks it. I think the ending is worth it. A lot of people say that the ending is... Well, yeah, we're in spoiler... The yeah, we're in spoiler territory now. So the ending is, if you've seen it, if you haven't seen it, whatever, we're about to spoil it. It's New Age Scarface, basically. It's, yeah, New Age Scarface. <laughs> At the end of the movie, James Franco, Ashley Benson, and Vanessa Hudgens' characters show up to Gucci Mane's character's house, big house. They pull up to it in a boat at night. They start walking. Some great shots, by the way. This movie... Harmony Crean described the cine- to the cinematographer on how to shoot this movie is like, imagine we're shooting through a pack of Skittles because there's just crazy colors yeah. everywhere and they look amazing. That's definitely one of the pluses to this one movie. Scene is the in cinematography. Particular, one scene in particular is when they're doing drugs um, right before they get arrested and like the camera is just changing, like the colors are changing and everything. Like yeah, that. it's, it's really all cool like shots. it's like morphing and all that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the three characters show up to the Gucci Mane's house. They walk in. Uh, James Franco gets pegged off right away, like instantaneously, <laughs> yeah. and then the two girls continue to walk down and through the guy's yard as there's all these like gangster bodyguards everywhere, and they literally pop and kill everyone. <laughs> in the and a lot of people are like, "Oh, two girls wouldn't do that against a bunch of gangsters." Yeah, but it just fit towards the movie. Yeah, like I I know obviously when you're watching it when it ended, like even after the first time, I was like. That wasn't totally implausible, but obviously I could see people getting pissed off at that. Yeah, I mean, like, the whole time, though, they're building up these two girls to be such crazy psychopaths where it's like they don't really give a fuck about anything. Yeah, compared to the other two girl characters. So it kind of makes sense that, like, they would go in and just take all these people out. I mean, mean, would you really like the movie if they just got killed at the very end and it was like, oh, we just watched this for nothing? (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so, I mean, I like the ending. I would say... Of all, all the things that I didn't like about the movie, the ending wasn't one of them. Like, I mm-hmm. thought the ending was perfect. Exactly. I, I would say the same thing, too. Yeah. But, yeah, like I was saying before, the cinematography is brilliant. It's filmed... He, Carmody Kareen likes to film his movies like documentaries. So, of course, this one's filmed like a documentary again, like pretty much all handheld. Uh, but what I love is he goes into real locations with real people. Apparently, there's a scene where it's right when James Franco busts the girls out of prison uh, right. where they go to a, a pool a pool bar, like a pool hall. Uh, in the ghetto in Florida uh, in the middle of the day and apparently everyone around them is real people except for of course the four main girls and James Franco right. and they just kind of filmed it around them like a documentary which I think is awesome and definitely needs to be done more because you, w- you couldn't I don't know it's hard it's not that you couldn't tell but I don't know there's just a sense of realism I think that it adds to it and I think though you can only do that with certain movies because like could you imagine if in Batman like <laughs> You have all these real people watching, like, this guy in this Batmobile just drive by. Like, it Oh, yeah, everyone would be like, oh, it's Batman, yeah. it's Batman. <laughs> no, yeah, it wouldn't make Yeah, so sense. not every movie could be able to pull that off, that's for sure. Right. But, um, uh, another spoiler, basically, yeah, like we were saying, like, the, the, oh, do you gotta take a call there? No, no. Oh, okay. Good. Um, uh, 
Yeah, the the pacing really slows down right after the script. Oh, okay, actually, let's get on to the editing. So the editing in this movie is, like, genius editing. Like, it's hard to describe the editing, because we'll describe it to you, but you'll be like, what? And you'll have to see it for yourself. But, like, literally, this a scene will start out, and then as the scene starts playing, you'll get a... You'll, all of a sudden, it'll skip to the end of the scene. So think of it in terms of Pulp Fiction. So Pulp Fiction, the storyline's all over the place. It's kind of similar to that, where every scene, as every scene starts, it'll, it'll show the beginning of a scene, and then it'll cut to shots from the end of the scene, and then it'll cut back to the beginning, cut back to the end, until eventually at the very end of the scene, you're watching what's technically the middle of the scene. <laughs> so it's, it's so weird to describe, but it's amazing at the same time. Yeah, and sometimes they cut two scenes together, so you're watching what the next scene will be while you're watching the scene that's already going on at the same time Mm -hmm. yeah like one one i really noticed on the second viewing that i didn't really notice on the first viewing is when selena gomez's character is about to leave and she's like guys i have a feeling something bad's gonna happen and then it quickly shows you a shot of james franco's bloody hand while he's playing his piano and then it cuts back to them at the bus and you're like what the fuck was that and it does everything like that like to go back to the end scene you see the girls talking on the phone and in your mind, you're like, okay, this is them. And they're talking to their mother. Yeah. And and you think that they're calling them before they're about to go shoot up this gangster's house. And then as the scene plays out, you find out that this is after they've sh- already shot up the house. Yeah. Which I think is a really cool method. And I would love to try it in one of my own movies. So another scene that stands out in my mind is where uh, James Franco's on his bed showing the two girls his quote-unquote shit. <laughs> and all this shit. I lo- yeah, I love that scene too. That was one of my favorites. And uh, yeah, and then you find out later on that that scene actually is like after a whole bunch of other scenes. Like they show it way before all this stuff happens. And it's just kind of like, it's really cool how they do that. And you're like, what happened to the other two girls? It's kind of like a spoiler alert midway through the film. It's great. Yeah, I thought uh, another thing was that I've never seen a Selena Gomez movie, but I'm ass- <laughs> I'm assuming that when you see the trailers for this movie, you're assuming that she's gonna be in this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And th- thinking about it now, it would have been interesting to see how she played more into it later on in the movie. But as yeah. soon as she gets busted out of jail, she goes to that pool hall scene and she starts crying, and James Franco's trying to comfort her, and she's just really creeped out by this whole situation. So she just takes right off, and she's out of the movie. And you're like, is she gonna come back? Yeah. No, she's right out of the movie. I mean, there's not too many directors that would just midway through a movie get rid of their lead star. Yeah, because that's the thing, too. She's literally the lead. Like, from the beginning of the movie, we're following her and the other three girls, but, like, she's she's the main of the four girls, and then all of a sudden she just leaves, and then James Franco kind of takes over as the main character after she leaves. Yeah, it's it's a cool little transition there, and... I think that's the part the point of the movie where it really just switches over and turns into a true crime drama. Yeah. It's awesome. And, um, yeah, the, what, what was one of the other favorite scenes I was going to say? You mentioned all my the shit scene. scene. I love, yeah, the strip <laughs> club scene is probably my favorite scene in the whole movie. Oh, yeah. Just because it's, it's so well done. Like, Gucci Mane, if you guys are familiar with Gucci Mane, I had no idea what this guy looked like. I knew about his rap songs yeah. before this, this movie. But, like, this is just a real-life note. What is with the giant ice cream on his face, tattooed on his face? That is nuts, man. I yeah. thought it was fake. He's literally got a giant ice cream cone with three scoops of ice cream on it, literally <laughs> taking up the whole left side of his face. He's just telling you he doesn't give a fuck. Yeah, man. And then you see him later in the in the uh, a tub, and he's literally just all inked up. He's crazy. But, like, I would never get a giant ice cream tatted on my face. Um, but he was good in this movie. I'm looking forward to seeing him act more because I think he was pretty awesome. He was <laughs> actually good. Like, he was, he, he was great in that scene. Like... You're cutting back and forth, for, and there is another editing thing, too. During the strip club scene, it starts off with James Franco and the girls showing up to this strip club, and then all of a sudden it cuts to James Franco and Gucci Mane talking in the back of the strip club, and it kind of keeps going back and forth, and then at the end of the scene, Gucci Mane approaches James Franco and is like, yo, let's talk in the back. And then it cuts to them after they've talked, and it's like them outside, and he's like, get the fuck out of here, or something like that. <laughs> and it's like, oh my god, it's brilliant. It works. It, like, it sounds weird... If you haven't he- seen the movie, it sounds weird to describe, but you have to see it, especially if you're a film buff, because, like, there's a couple of friends of mine who I really recommended this to. They both saw it. They said it was okay. They weren't really the biggest fans of it, 
Uh, but they, one of the things they did say that they took away from this movie was the editing because it's just so out there and crazy and it's such a crazy way to edit a movie. The one thing that I would say is kind of a downside as far as, uh, in my eyes at least, is the sound editing was kind of weird. Like, there's a lot of parts in the movie where they kind of repeat the same dialogue over and over and that's another thing I've heard people note about it where it's like, all right, like they literally just are saying the same things over and over and they kind of edit it so that you keep hearing these little like voice cues almost throughout the movie. Yeah, it's like um, that's where and I, I, usually I don't think they do it too much in the beginning. They do it more. They do it a little uh, bit in the beginning. Do they? Like the when they're just like spring break. <laughs> that that's true. I don't, but I don't mind that part. It's right. when it's later on in the movie when they're doing the pool scene and they keep going. Are you scared? Are oh, you yeah. scared or yeah, something like that? That happens a lot too. Yeah, I, I wasn't a big fan of that one. I like the spring break one. Right. Because you don't really notice it and it's because it's a spring break movie, so it's natural for them to just go, Yeah, spring break. <laughs> but just the ending part when they're getting ready to shoot up the house and they just keep going, Are you scared? Are you scared? <laughs> and it does it for yeah. like I don't know, scared it feels like things. five minutes almost. Yeah. It's just like, Are you scared? And it's different images being played, but well then, that's his style though for you. Even before they uh, they do the the robbery, which is amazing by the way, the first robbery, the uh, beginning robbery. Yeah, I want to talk about that after. That's my favorite shot in the whole movie. But before that happens, you just hear them go like, "Let's do this shit. Don't be scared." And then like literally two seconds later, they they're like, "Let's do this shit. Don't be scared." Like, yeah. again. it's so weird. It's like it, that's the Harmony <laughs> Korean style for you. But like, uh, yeah, my favorite shot in the whole movie is when they first go and rob the chicken place. And I love when movies do this, too. This is one of my favorite things movies do, is the three girls go to rob uh, a chicken restaurant uh, to get money to go to spring break. And when you see the robbery at first, they're driving El Camino. Two girls are in the back and one girl's driving. The whole thing is shot from the passenger seat shooting the driver, and we just see out the driver's window. So the girls jump out from the back and run into the back of this chicken store. And then the girl driving just starts circling the restaurant. And then once she starts circling around to the front, you can see through the window of the restaurant, the girls just robbing and like hitting everything with hammers and taking everyone's money and just fucking up this restaurant. Yeah. And then, and then they literally finish the robbery all in this one shot, one take. They run back out to the car, get it, and it, the car takes off and then the shot ends. And that was my personal favorite shot. I love when movies do long shots like that, especially when, like, we've seen a robbery mo in a movie ton of times, yeah. and we've seen what happens inside a robbery. It's I've never great. robbed a place, but I know I got the general gist of what it's <laughs> going to look like. So I thought it was really awesome for him to show the robbery on the outside. And it just makes it feel more realistic, because when you're looking at something in real life, you're not editing back and forth between different parts of the room you're looking at it from one yeah you're watching it play out in real time in real time it it makes i don't know i think it's probably one of the best things that you can do in a movie like the place beyond the pines i know we're not talking about that right now but there's so much of that in that movie where that's part of the reason why it's my favorite movie and yeah long takes hollywood needs to do more long takes because they're they're just genius that's why kubrick's one of my favorite and and that's why G.I. Joe sucked a bag of dicks. Oh, yeah. Well, well we're going to review G.I. <laughs> Joe with Phil at some point. Um, but, yeah, they, Hollywood needs to do long things. Like, QT does them all the time where he'll just... Oh, yeah. He won't necessarily move the camera. There's some great long takes uh, in Django in particular. Yeah. And, and, of course, his other movies. But what he... Kill Bill. Yeah, what he does more in particular is kind of just let the camera sit there while the actors are acting. And it's not cutting back and forth from close-up to close-up. It's like a medium shot of two of them just acting. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I was about to, oh, same with Place Beyond the Pines. Yeah. That, that movie, it won't just cut back and forth between a close-up of Ryan Gosling and a close-up of Eva Mendes. It'll let the whole scene play out like a documentary. Uh, like this, now that, now that we kind of think of it, both movies are filmed very much like a documentary. Oh, yeah. They're both filmed handheld. For sure. They're both filmed like documentaries. They both have long takes. But that's what I love, is long takes, because you actually see the actors acting versus them having to act for five seconds until the shot's done. Even Michael Bay is great with that. Like, you might hate on Michael Bay, but he's got some great shots like that where it's just one take. I mean, I know, obviously, he has to cut it because he's going through walls and stuff like that, but yeah. since it's it's all happening without it cutting back and without forth... Without visible yeah. editing cuts. Like, he's trying to hide those cuts. It just looks, it just looks so much more special and 
It's much greater. It makes the scene more memorable, I find, because yeah. you you watch it play out longer. Like that's that's why I love Kubrick, and that's why I love QT. Kubrick is famous for it. Like, oh yeah, Full Metal Jacket's one of my favorite Kubrick movies, and like one of my favorite parts is when. Uh, Bird is the Word starts playing and it just starts following that cameraman as he's filming all the uh, soldiers down the line and you think it's going to cut but it just keeps going but it's amazing because of all this shit that's happening in the background like soldiers are running yeah. everywhere explosions are going off yeah. like long takes are the best <laughs> Breaking Bad another reason why it's great Breaking Bad <laughs> does long takes all the time too they're great so figure it out Hollywood but uh, yeah that, like I said it's probably this is a short review so Basically, what it breaks down to is I would definitely say go see it. I'm not sure if it's still in theaters by the time you're listening to this. It will be on DVD pretty soon. I believe it comes out in June on Blu-ray and DVD, as well as, of course, it'll be on Video On Demand, iTunes, all that jazz. Uh, so definitely check it out. I would definitely highly recommend it, like I said, especially if you're a film buff. Uh, if you liked, I love, I'll, I'll actually let you say it better, but uh, if you like, I really enjoyed it. If you like Drive and you like Piranha 3D... Just put those two movies together. Yeah, like, I would say it's like Drive with Girls Gone Wild. It's yeah, like, yeah. that, like, not in terms of storyline, of course, for Drive, <laughs> but in terms of tone. Yeah. Mixed with kind of like a Girls Gone Wild tone, because there is a lot of female, not necessarily nudity, but a lot of what you said yeah. is pervert shots. Yeah, it's like, it's like a pervert had the camera and was like, all right, I'm just going to look at what I want to look at. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's like, all right, I know this is what the audience wants to see. Not for the whole movie, but for, For there's certain shots where it sticks out and he just holds it and you're just, and then at first you're like, oh yeah, nice. And then as it holds, you're kind of like, I kind of feel creepy right now. Like I just picture those actresses watching that on the screen and being like, oh man, I can't believe (laughs) we're in this. Anyways. But yeah, I say go watch it. I really liked it. There's a lot of people who I know who really aren't into movies that didn't like it. So I say this is kind of a movie you'd have to make up for yourself. But don't go in expecting one movie. I think what the reason why a lot of people didn't like this movie uh, is because they went in expecting some other type of gangster type of movie and didn't expect this kind of slow, artsy type of movie. And that's why people don't like a lot of movies. <laughs> and that, exactly, look at Drive. Like, even people still hate it on Drive, and it's like, are you fucking dumb? Drive is easily one of the best movies in the past five to ten years. Yeah. But, yeah, I say check it out. What do you th- say, Jake? I say for sure check it out. Um, yeah, 7.5 out of 10 I gave it. I'd say if, it, if it's coming to a theater near you still... Go watch it while it's in theaters because it's, it's kind of a movie that you should see in theaters for sure. Yeah, help support it. Harmony Korine, this is his most mainstream movie yet. So hopefully it did do very well. The budget of this movie was only like $2 million. I heard rumors of $5 million as well. But um, there it is, budget $5 million. So a $5 million budget. I, it, I believe it definitely surpassed that for opening weekend. Oh, Gross. Yeah. Looks like the U.S. gross in total was 13.9 mil, so that's great for Harmony Kareem because his movies are always dirt cheap anyway, so that always looks good for profit for him. And plus, we don't even see the international numbers because of these Disney stars being in it. I'm sure it made a decent amount of coin as well. Yeah. Uh, but if you guys want to follow us on Twitter, I'm at DKG Chris. And I'm at the real DJ Eagle. Check, I'm going to have a SoundCloud out soon, so check that out, too. Yeah, check that out. We're constantly posting podcasts. Uh, I just posted my first interview podcast with my former film prof, Dennis Austin. Uh, I thought that was really good. We got a couple good responses on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just finishing up my next episode with Lee Chambers, and then I got a couple that I'm going to record next week. Hopefully those still go through. Uh, so, yeah, we're just going to try and pump out as much content to you guys as possible. we got a ton of more movie reviews, of course, coming out for you. I'll put up some beats. He'll throw up some beats. Follow us I, uh, on Twitter as well uh, for this podcast. It's at DromeZone. That's at D-R-O-M-E-Z-O-N-E. Uh, that's where you can find all the links to the latest podcast as well as DromeZone.net. If you go there, it's literally just a blog. You just keep scrolling down, and it's only our podcast there. So yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you guys some more. Peace out.